Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Uh, please be advised that this meeting will be recorded and posted on the Council's YouTube channel. Um, can all those speak and ensure you switch on or off your microphone <laughs> before addressing the meeting? And remember to switch it off when you have finished speaking. When members uh, are voting, can you please raise your hand? Uh, item one, apologies for absence. Councillor Kyra. Yeah. Uh, any other apologies? I see none. Item two, uh, urgent business. I see no urgent business. Item three, do any member have any personal or financial interest to declare on any item on the agenda? See no declarations. Item four, is cabinet happy to agree the minutes of the last meeting? Thank you very much. I will now sign the minutes. Now move on to item five, uh, to agree the annual plan for the council. Um, and as you know, when we set out our Greenwich, our vision was to improve the health the public well-being, the health and well-being of our residents. Um, this report beyond us today will begin to articulate the, out, the, the missions that we're working towards and the actions we're taking to make sure we achieve our missions. But it also stipulates the, the, the way we will measure our success and report back on what we have achieved. Um, do members require a briefing? Do members have any questions or comments in terms of their respective areas? Sorry, can I, could, could we have a briefing on this, please? Yeah, sure. Here we go. <laughs> right. As I said at the beginning, the, the, um, the R Greenwich sets out the vision for our overall council. And as you know, in 2022, when we um, created and started consultation, our, consultation on our vision, we went out to our residents, we went out to our partners, and we went out to our community groups. Uh, we had various conversations, and that helped us set our vision with the overarching strategy of thinking about the public health and well-being of our residents. Since then, Year on year, we produce an annual plan, which is about how we achieve the 20 missions that we set out, of which everyone has their cross cutting respective areas that we all contribute to. In addition to that, uh, we go through it with all of our officers and we sit down and think about how we achieve those missions. Now, recently we held a partnership summit, which was really helpful in thinking about how we work more closely with our partners to be able to get and deliver on our missions. So the report before you today sets and feeds back on what the challenges are that we still have in our communities, what our achievements are, and what our priority areas are for the year ahead, which is presented to you today by virtue of the 20 missions that we have and what outcomes in, the, in our, in our uh, plan and how we'll achieve them. Thank you very much. Does any member have any questions or comments? Um, I want to make a comment, um, Chair, and that's to say, I think this is a really good document. I think it enables, it's very transparent. It puts on the table our direction of travel. And I think particularly importantly, it enables people to see how we measure um, where we're going. And um, I think in terms of a public facing document, this is really helpful to the um, population as a whole to understand yeah. the direction and pressure. Thank you very much. And just to say um, in response to that, I appreciate that and appreciate all the work that cabinet partners and the communities have put in. Obviously, we spoke to our residents who uh, had the little consultation phone calls where they could leave us messages. And obviously, some of the key messages that residents left in terms of their areas where we feel we can improve and areas where we feel are de doing well are reported in this report as well. Um, but more importantly, I hope everyone has seen the launch of the new R Greenwich website, which, which is up on the main Greenwich website. And in there, you can see how we are holding ourselves against each, mich each mission 
and, uh, and, out, and uh, outcome that we're looking to achieve and measure success. Because I think what's really important is that we measure the success of the impact we have as a council. Uh, do any members have any other questions on, on our Greenwich? Okay, are members happy to de agree to the decisions as outlined in section 1.1 of the report? Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move on to item six to agree to continue with the development of Marion Road and Marion Grove. Uh, and uh, I will hand over to the cabinet member to open. Thank you, Chair, um, and, and, and a thank you to the officers for working, um, their continual work on this, uh, on this project and also for providing the report on this. Um, I, just, I want to say too much just to say that we, uh, this is a, uh, the project itself um, always proposes a huge opportunity for our borough and our residents to create um, affordable homes, and the whole development itself is still on course to providing 50% affordable homes to our residents. Which is, which is, we can all agree, which is amazing what we need. Um, and at, at this point, we, we are to agree that the Marion Road and Marion Grove should uh, go ahead based on the options recommended. Um, and so, and I understand that there are, there, there are some changes here, but we also have to take into the current climate for the changes that, um, that have been um, suggested. However, overall, the, the project is still on course to provide over 1,600 homes and 50% affordable um, homes for our residents. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, before we move to an officer briefing, does anyone have any questions or comments they'd like to put? Uh, or, I don't see any hands. We'll move on to uh, bring in Jeremy Smalley for a briefing on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you, councillors, for your time and attention. Um, as Councillor Rahman has said, this report relates to the partnership between Lovell, Paragon Azra, and the Royal Borough of Greenwich which the council entered into in 2013. And it concerns three former council estates that surround Woolwich. So there was the former Connaught estate, which is now Trinity Walk, uh, Marion Road and Grove, and Morris Walk, North and South. And back in 2007, eight, nine, there were lots of discussions about what to do with the deteriorating housing stock on those three estates. And the council couldn't afford to bring the uh, homes up to decent home standards. And the rules relating to the housing revenue at that uh, account at that time didn't allow the council to borrow to do work on those buildings. Moreover, the cost benefit analysis of investing a lot of money in those buildings was such that it was made more sense to knock down the development um, at developments and rebuild. And that's what's been happening since 2013. And the total scheme, as Councillor Rahman has said, is to deliver over 1,600 new homes. Um, and previously there were 1,000, so there's an additionality of, of over um, 500, 600 homes. And uh, this really delivers against the R Greenwich missions, particularly the um, having people uh, having access to safe, uh, good quality housing but also um, developing neighborhoods which are positive to live in, and also um, development that delivers change for those communities around the development, and the communities around uh, Morris and Marion have suffered in particular in recent years. So this is a really positive change. The partnership is governed by a development agreement between uh, the council level and uh, Paragon Azra. And over the uh, 12 years it's been in existence, or 11 years it's been in existence, there have been a number of variations, deeds of variations. And uh, the council has done uh, considerably better than it originally envisaged in good times. So, for instance, on Connaught, um, due to the commercial arrangements in the development agreement, there was a land value and an overage payment which not only enabled the council to buy some council homes on the development, but was also generated a significant amount of capital that has been invested in Greenwich builds to match with HRA borrowing. So a really positive story overall. Um, and in 2022, Cabinet agreed to what's known as the fourth deed of variation to the development agreement. And that governed um, the council being able to purchase up to 265 new homes that would have been built for private sale uh, back on the development of Marion Road and Grove uh, uh, and Morris Walk North and South. And 
Uh, in return for that bulk purchase, the council also secured the acceleration of the development overall, so it speeded up the pace of development. And I'm sure you're all aware that Morris Walk is now delivering and the council will be uh, in receipt of 175 units at Morris Walk shortly um, and also will have the nomination rights on the Paragon Azra social rented units on Morris Walk North. So really good news. This report relates to a fifth deed variation and it relates to the balance of 90 units that were on Marion Road and Grove. And at the time the fourth deed of variation was entered into, those 90 units weren't specified. Marion Road was covered by a development, uh, an outline planning application. The detail was not specified. Um, subsequently, the council, partly due to the antisocial behaviour uh, on the site, but also as part of developing uh, the site more quickly, uh, agreed to call for the demolition of Marion Road and Grove, and that's happened. And as part of that arrangement, it was uh, important that the council underwrote the demolition costs. So if the developer walked away, the council would effectively have to pick up those costs. Now, with Mar Morris Walk under construction, uh, Lovell have started to prepare their reserve matters planning application for Marion Road and Grove and the discussions around the 90 units uh, that were due to come to the council have been had alongside the other units, the units that Paragon Azra are going to take. And um, what's been uh, discussed is that due to significant uh, headwinds, for instance, build cost inflation in particular, but also borrowing costs, um, the viability of the scheme of the final phase is under serious threat. And so we've been working with our partners in Lovell and Paragon Azra and at the GLA to discuss how we might be able to proceed uh, and, and uh, continue the development. And what that means for the council is that we would take uh, less units as council homes. So down from the indicative 90 that we'd agreed as part of the fourth deed of variation down to 53. But what we have done is insist that Paragon Azra transfer what was going to be shared ownership units into social rent units. Um, so the options before you as, as members is, is that firstly you could choose not to accept this fifth deed of variation. The challenge of that would be that Lovell could walk away from the agreement and the council would obviously still own the land and it would be a cleared site but it wouldn't have a development partner it would have to procure another development partner um, and there would be delays and so on. The second option is you ag agree to this uh, revised mix. And so what we're promoting is a pragmatic um, solution. On balance, it ensures that the three estates will have over just over 50% affordable housing. Um, and the capital from Connaught has helped fund the Greenwich Builds programme. So, Whilst on the face of it, it's difficult, I appreciate for members in a housing crisis to be seen to be uh, reducing the numbers. I think it's the pragmatic solution to make sure that overall housing supply continues and a good supply of affordable housing continues. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy, for that uh, really detailed presentation and uh, thank you. Uh, we'll now go to questions. Uh, uh, Councillor Lacau, Councillor Taggart Ryan, uh, Councillor Mary Cousins and Councillor Smith. Um, I, I just, well, sorry, mine is a comment. So, yep. um, I think this pragmatic approach is really important. I think um, what's not quantified here is, you know, if this did not go into completion, the numbers that we have in uh, temporary accommodation and the costs to the council is just out of the, uh, you know, it, it's unimaginable. <clears throat> and um, also bringing forward early completion um, has an impact on those numbers. And I think it's really important that we keep that in mind as well. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Tagarine. Thank you. Um, I would like to echo Councillor Lacau's uh, point. My question is, um, Regarding those that have now um, have moved essentially from social housing to social rent, I just wanted if you could explain more about the, the rent in those and what, what market share that would be going forward or to, 
at this time? Do we know? Sorry, can I, did I, uh, I want to check I understood the question. So how, from shared ownership to social rent. So those that would have been social rent, which are now going to affordable rent, could we explain just more what the affordable rent would be? Okay, yeah, so um, I don't know the actual numbers of the difference between a council rent and a London affordable rent. So the GLA sets the rent standard and allows for an affordable rent, but I don't know whether, Jamie, I'm sorry to look at you, but I don't know whether you know the difference. It's probably a bit of an unfair question on the spot, but I can find out and we'll come back to you. London affordable rent is higher than council rents. Off the top of my head, Councillor, London affordable rent is about 170 to 180 pounds per week. And that compares to, um, depending on how it's calculated, um, our, our, and that's for two bed, and our, our um, council or, 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 or formula rents um, for a housing association or the council are between 110 and 130 pounds a week. And market is about, 350, 370. Uh, Councillor Cousins. Uh, thank you. I was just about to go into um, Google search, but I'll leave that. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, similarly wanted to just clarify. So if I'm understanding correctly, although there is a split between what, so we have taken a reduction in our social housing, <laughs> but if I'm understanding you correctly, the um, the developers are also going to be converting their affordable to social housing as well. Is that what you're saying? And then therefore, overall, is there a gain in technically social housing as opposed to affordable? Because affordable is not social housing. Thank you. There's, yeah, the short answer is if you go back to um, 2013, right up to 2022, Marion Road Estate would have had no council housing on it at all. It would have been developed by Lovell with the vast majority of it, 60%, 65% being for private sale, and the balance, 35%, being for affordable housing with a 70%, 30% split between social rent and shared ownership. The 2022 cabinet decision meant that the council stepped in and was going to buy 90 of the units that were going to be private sales. So they were all additional uh, affordable homes and in council terms, council homes at council rents. The change now is that we're introducing, as you say, a re reduction in what the council will own from 2022. Lovell will be able to sell 33, and Paragon Azra have swapped what was the shared ownership units to be social rent. So overall, there is still more social rent than there would have been. And I think sorry, it's complicated, but I, th I think to come into that um, uh, discussion, I think that within the affordable rent space, there's different types of affordable rents. Now, the very mere fact that we're increasing, we're probably decreasing in shared ownership, which it has the additional element of the rent and paying the mortgage, it's probably better that we have the social rent. But more importantly, I think, I guess the question has to be, is our ambition to only build council homes or increase homes of all types? And I think, actually, we would sit here and not be realistic to ourselves if we were to say, well, we're gonna build only council homes for everybody. We want more social rented units through housing associations, through the council, through the affordable rent space. Uh, and actually we will take that benefit rather than seeing this whole site ground to a halt. And I think that's the premise of which, in, in which kind of where I place myself in this uh, current decision our role as a council is to make sure we are convening partnerships around things that deliver homes for people which are affordable to their incomes. Um, Councillor Smith and then Councillor Raman. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've been around a long time and um, 
this development of the Woolwich Estates, uh, Denise has been around equally as long. Sorry to call you out for being old, Denise. Um, <laughs> but um, when I first started my life on the council, I was 12 years in Thamesmead Moorings, and this started during that time. I wasn't a Woolwich councillor. When I moved to Woolwich Riverside, um, it was in flow, and there were countless meetings upon meetings upon meetings of which we were looking at various phases, and uh, you know, the, the Connaught, um, old Connaught came out of the ground first. Um, so it's been a long time coming, and frankly, I will be highly delighted when the final stage is completed, because let me tell you, when I was a, uh, a ward member that included Woolwich Dockyard, where it is situated now, um, there were complaints after complaints after complaints because we were using um, the decanted site as temporary housing, or PA were, um, the, the quality of the housing was atrocious, the, the amount of crime and um, antisocial behaviour that was going on. So, frankly, the residents were highly delighted when the demolition ball went in um, and, and will be pleased to see it. So I am delighted that it's being completed. I'm a little bit sad that I'm not there to see it, but I would like to go and see the, the first handover for, for Morris because I think that will be a, um, an absolute um, groundbreaking moment. Um, but I suppose just for clarification, I, I don't know if you can do this without me going through every line of the report. So what were the numbers of units in the former Morris Walk Marion configuration of what we're developing now um, and what are the numbers after and what's the split between private and social housing uh, and whatever because I, I personally think I'm, I'm less inclined to to go on a phase by phase table than what we've got overall on the whole development because I think we I think, if I'm right, what we've got overall on the whole development is good news. So could you clarify that, please, Jeremy? Yeah, that's right. So when the estates were formally in their existence, there was just over 1,000 units, and it will end up with over 1,600 units at the end. Uh, Morris uh, Walk North will have 304 units, um, of which the council will own 175 and Paragon Azra will own 87 social rent and 42 shared ownership. And Morris Walk South will be 462 units. Uh, PA uh, Paragon Azra will have 124, and private sale will be 338. And Marion Road and Grove will be 165, of which the council will have 53, and Paragon Azra 79, private sale 33. So overall, it's uh, more homes than were there before. And since 2013, there will be more social homes there and more affordable homes than there were before because of the intervention of the council. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is it to close or? I'll just ask one additional uh, question for myself. Uh, thanks, Jeremy, for that. Um, my last one is following this decision, um, what guarantees on, because obviously there's a lot of risk in the economy at the moment, what guarantees do we have on our partnership that will make sure that we get to a place of completion? Yeah, so what the report is asking for is delegated authority to enter into a fifth deed of variation. And uh, clearly for us, what we want to make sure is, is that the fifth deed of variation locks Lovell in to build the scheme out. Um, it also deals with the commerciality of us buying the 53 units. Um, it also will deal with the uh, Paragon Azra switch from, social, um, from shared ownership to social rent. And importantly, it will reinstate an overage provision so that if the market improves considerably beyond a baseline, then the council will uh, benefit from the overage on the 33 units to be sold with a 60-40 split in favour of the council. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Raman. Thank you, Chair. And yeah, thank you again um, to the officers for the report. Um, I guess um, I'll, I'll, I'll throw in my own kind of um, 
I walk down memory lane here as well, just because it's an area that I grew up close to, and I know the estate quite well, the previous estate. I had friends when I was in primary school that used to live in those estates, and I remember the quality, or not the great quality that they were living in. And I remember in primary school, one of the things that we did is plant a tree in the estate so it could be less concrete. Mm. And the reason I mention that is because the development provides that st st step going forward for, for that area in terms of revitalizing the area, bring some sense of, in terms of design, some sense of greenness and good quality homes for all residents. Um, and when looking at mixed tenure housing, and I think that's, in terms of our greens, that's what we want. We want a development that kind of brings in those from all walks of life, and not just a specific demographic or social group. Because um, we know, in terms of regeneration, it will improve, um, through the people that come into the area, it will improve the area. So I, we are, I'm sure everyone is looking forward to seeing the, um, the development being complete. Um, we will have some hiccups along the way, but I know the officers are working pragmatically to get things done, and obviously we will be here to make sure that we are sticking to the values of our missions and aims in terms of our Greenwich as well, to make sure the developments stick to the, the standards that they promise. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, that brings us to a close. Thanks for your presentation, Jeremy. Um, I'm going to move us straight to the vote now because I think we've all had the opportunity to feed into this uh, discussion and debate and ask questions and clean clarifications. Are members happy to agree the decisions as outlined in section 1.1 to 1.6? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now move on to item seven. Uh, this is the scheme and estimate report for development of a all new through secondary school post-16 pieces for special education needs and Hargood Road. Now, I know we have the absence of uh, the cabinet member here, but I would welcome the opportunity for a short uh, uh, apologies. I was thinking of Councillor Kyra, uh, but a short introduction, then we can answer any questions. Uh, Councillor Raman, did you want to say open this report about the new school? Sorry, um, yeah, um, I do apologize. I don't have too much to add to this report. I've been swamped with all these different reports and I'm still getting used to my, my cabinet role. <laughs> um, um, so I do, I, um, so in, in terms of, like, so I, would, I just want to say thank you to the officers for the report and the work that they're doing on this, on this site. And we do need these kind of provisions and we do need um, kind of to make sure that um, this kind of work is kind of, um, kind of progress. So I'll just kind of hand it over to the officers to kind of take over from this point. Thank you. Cool. I know the time and obviously we've got quite a few things to get through on the agenda. Uh, I'll just give you about a minute to summarise. Thank you. Sure, thanks for that. So yes, I'm Daniel Staines, the Assistant Director. Um, in brief summary, the report is aiming to set out the scheme and the estimated budget cost for delivering the project. It's a new build SEND school for 128 pupils in the borough. Um, great need for SEND, as members will, I'm sure, be aware. Um, the scheme itself has been designed, it's gone through the planning application process and has received a resolution to, uh, for consent. We've been busily developing the design, it's now in the process of going out to tender to get the final cost. So this, what you see here, is the estimated uh, budget for the scheme. Through the design process, um, we've understood the site uh, better and done some detailed investigations. And through that process, we've um, found some cost increases which are summarised in the report. Um, and that's captured within the budget presented here to date. I think I would say uh, we haven't actually concluded the tender process yet, so there's still some risk that cost may change, but uh, we've built into the budget that you see here some contingency to cater for some of those fluctuations. Um, the next steps will be to tender the scheme, start construction on sites with the aim of opening the school uh, in autumn next year. Thank you very much. Um, do members have any questions or comments? Councillor Smith. Um, thank you, Daniel, for the report. Um, we desperately need these places, I know and understand that, and, and I support it. My one question is just that um, the, the stuff that's in the program in um, page one, two, three, four, nineteen, which you know, I know you've just said, um, open in um, autumn 2025. That 
looks like a really tight timetable to me. Um, and, and I suppose I wanted just to test the confidence in the achievement of that. Um, and, and, and if we're not totally confident, what's, what's the likely slippage in it? Thank you. Any other questions at all? No? Okay. Daniel? Firstly, a yeah, really valid point and great question. Um, we're delivering this scheme through an off-site construction, so it's a very rapid construction phase which will help deliver the programme. Uh, we're confident in that programme as of today. What we've also done is we've got the school on board now through the Compass Partnership for Schools and we're working very closely with them to put in place a contingency plan should it not be ready. Uh, and we've agreed that with them already, so there is some capability to go beyond that date should that programme not be delivered. As I sit here today, we're confident we can achieve that November date, given uh, all things being equal. All right. Thank you. And just on, on uh, uh, costs, obviously we know the current um, uh, uh, bill costs are rising at the moment. Do you see yourself uh, keeping within budget and what implications that will that have on the school? So, yeah, the, you're right, the costs are still fluctuating in the market. I think it's stabilised a little bit since um, the crazy inflation period we had about two years ago, um, but they're still on the rise. Uh, as I said, we've got some contingency built into this project budget you see here. There's also still some remaining um, allowances built into the education capital programme. Should it go over what we see here, we've got some capacity to cope with that. Um, ultimately, we'll be looking to make sure the scheme comes within this budget and undertake value engineering essentially to try and revise the scope or specification where we can and still deliver the same number of places in a lower cost way. Thank you very much. And as, as you undergo that process, can my request that we keep the cabinet member uh, updated through all those different challenges just to ensure that we're all updated on it. Um, do we, uh, any other questions? No? Yep, um, Councillor Smith. Uh, on that same page, 418, the DfE announcing additional high needs grant to mean that we don't have to pay any more money. I think that that is uh, something that we should celebrate, that we're actually getting some money for things that we need from the government. Quite right, and I think you mentioned that helps do that. Um, but more, more, uh, and in addition to that point, I guess, you know, I think one of the things you opened with about the need for SEND. And we all know the need has been rising. Obviously, myself and Councillor uh, Kyra have been going to schools, and that's been spoken about in a lot of places. A lot of parents are under a lot of pressure um, and, and need more support. So obviously, there is more need school for school places and places where people can have an inclusive education and get the right support that they need. Um, so I guess this is one that we are going to be keenly keeping our eyes on. Uh, I'll bring in Councillor Raman to wrap up. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just, uh, just, uh, just to add to that, we do need um, these spaces and we do need these facilities. And uh, in terms of our vision to make our borough inclusive and also in, the, in these times of financial difficulties, having facilities within the borough would also help families alleviate those additional costs that they may incur where they have to make provisions for that. So I think the more spaces that we can create within the borough, um, the, the better our residents will be. And I know many of us here who have who have had some personal um, kind of experiences of these um, would also kind of um, appreciate it. So, um, so yeah, thank you for the report again, and thank you for the work on this. Thank you. Are members happy to agree decisions 1.1 to 1.8? Please raise your hands. Agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now move on to um, item eight, uh, and almost a, a, a happy a happy moment to see this report come forward to agree to adopt the statement of community involvement and developers engagement charter uh, i'll hand over to councillor raman to present this is my first cabinet so hopefully this allows you to get familiar with my face and voice um what way to start um so yeah no, this is an exciting report so i will i will open the report and I'll hand it over to officers um, so I just say thank you to the officers and obviously thank you to the chair as well for uh, working on, the, on this report and, and providing the kind of the work on this. Um, and just to say this report is to adopt the Statement of Community Involvement, which is SCI and Developers Engagement Charter, DEC. Just a quick overview of what, the, what that really means. So in terms of the SCI, this is, um, um, this is a, a document which, in which the council sets out 
how they will engage residents, communities, businesses, and local organizations and other groups to ensure as many people as possible are able to contribute towards the plan making process and important individual planning decisions that affect them. So we can all really see why this is important. And in terms of the kind of uh, the DEC, um, it's, uh, it's aimed to it's aimed at developers, um, uh, those developing land in um, those aimed at developing land in Royal Greenwich to ensure best practice in early engagement with local residents, businesses, and community organisations prior to formal planning applications being made. So we can see why both of these elements are really important. So in terms of our um, uh, our vision for regeneration in Greenwich, we want to make sure um, that our communities are involved as early as possible in this process. Um, so having these laid out in a, in a document, which is a, a statutory document, will we'll make sure that we are informed, our residents are informed, and when it comes to developers, they are also informed of what is required of them, which is clearly laid out in these plans and processes. So, and this is why it's a very exciting document, and I can see why the leader is excited by this. I'm, I was reading this, and I've, I've heard many I've heard many feedback around developers and developments over the years, especially when I'm engaging with, with residents that they're not in, um, can, uh, they, they don't feel connected and they don't engage with us as early as possible. So hopefully this will help alleviate those issues. Um, and obviously it's, it's, it's a document in progress. So I just wanted to share my, you know, um, open the document and now pass it over to the officers to give us the, the context. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just before we open, um, I will say, uh, officers, Again, another minute just on in consideration of time. You don't need to go too long into it. Sure, thank you. Um, so, as, as Councillor Raman says, the, uh, the statement of community involvement is a statutory document that the council's bound to prepare by the planning legislation, and we're supposed to update just move that the every... mic a bit more closer Sorry. to you. Yeah. <clears throat> so, the SCI is a statutory document that we're bound to. Um, update every five years. So the last time this was formally updated was in 2020 in response to a COVID-19 pandemic. And before that, the previous version was dated 2016. Um, these two documents have been prepared in accordance with the council's wider community engagement framework that's been prepared. Um, and they complement that framework uh, and sit alongside that to um, consider uh, planning matters. Um, the uh, Council undertook a, a consultation, public consultation on both of the documents uh, in March and April of this year um, via Commonplace and in hard copy in libraries, etc. Um, so we received 72 comments cumulatively on both documents from a variety of stakeholders, including residents, members of the public, uh, residents associations and statutory organisations. So officers reviewed all those comments and made some changes to both documents to improve their clarity and effectiveness. Um, and I think around 25% of the comments that were made resulted directly in changes being made to make the documents clearer. Um, and yeah, I think the, the report obviously is, is to um, direct, uh, ask cabinet to agree to adopt the two documents formally so they'll then be publicized on the website and used in future um, to both uh, develop local planning policies through the local plan and through individual planning applications. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any comments or questions? Obviously, I'm going to comment. Uh, Councillor Cousins. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks. Just wanted to say that uh, meaningful community consultation or engagement by contractors is very important. We have had incidents, for example, our borough is bordered by other boroughs, and you'll find that, for example, in Abbey Wood, they're actually consulting in Bexley on something to do in Abbey Wood. And that does have a difference because residents will think, well, it's Bexley, it isn't Greenwich. So it is very important. And then if, if consultation like that to me wouldn't be meaningful. So I do hope that the implementation of this will be monitored along those lines as well, because it really is important when it comes to place. Thank you. I mean, on that point about monitoring, I guess, you know, officers can probably speak to some of the monitoring that happens as a result of when a developer submits a planning application. Uh, would you like to just expand on that for uh, Councillor Cousins? Yeah, sure. So um, once the documents are adopted, um, it, it gives some clear direction to developers in terms of what's expected of them in, in terms of best practice uh, and meaningful early engagement before the planning application is submitted. 
So the developer charter will then be reflected in our local validation list for planning applications. So this is a requirement on all major developers to provide a statement setting out how they've engaged with local people and how that feedback's been taken on board in development of the scheme before it's submitted. And is it correct that this rule will be reported when the application is considered at planning committee? Yes, planning it will committee. be part of the officer's report. So I think there is a real opportunity there um, to demonstrate what we as council have set out, our expectations of who they should be engaging, but actually we the consideration of the application for the committee to have a view on that. Uh, any other comments or questions? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well. I would just like to thank you for uh, the length of work because you've worked quite closely with the community engagement team on this work and this is a good opportunity of uh, cross collaboration around that but more importantly as we approach uh, the work around our local plan what's really exciting in this report is the community review panels and I think that will be a real opportunity to bring our communities in to think about how we consult on place how we consult on thinking about the vision and the future uh, of our local plan and and how we use their voices to shape it so it's a it's a real um, great work and I guess one thing to note is that obviously key to, key to me um, and, and the leadership that I'm trying to lead, this is all about community engagement. It is all about making sure we uh, encourage developers to do more. And I set out and, uh, and worked with the cabinet member to make sure that development charter is here. So I'm really proud that you guys have done it because it's not me, but you, know, you guys have done that work collectively to get there with other council officers. So I'm, I'm proud that it's nice to see it here today in front of cabinet. Um, so we'll now move to agree and check if everyone is happy to agree decision as outlined in section 1.1. Thank you very much. Um, now, there is no, uh, uh, I, I guess, uh, Councillor Raman, you are having a baptism of fire today uh, uh, in that sense, because um, the next one is also you, um, item eight. <laughs> Um, which is, uh, this is to enter into a lease to enable the long-term occupation of the flats shared uh, at the house at Royal Hill. Um, now, I note that uh, we have seen a lot of Royal Hill and we've been through this report collectively before, so I probably won't take a presentation on it, but I am very happy to see uh, the new opening of uh, uh, Royal Hill, which is a specialist uh, development supporting adults with learning disabilities. I went for the opening day myself and it was absolutely fantastic. And I know you as cabinet member will be leading on a visit to demonstrate the work that's being done there, uh, working with other councillors. So I think this is one that we're happy with and ready to go to, to, go to, a, to a, a comment on, a, a, to, to a decision on. So I'm gonna put it straight to the vote if that's okay. Are members happy to agree decisions that's outlined in section 1.1 to 1.4? Thank you very much. Um, I will now um, take the item 10, which is the Royal Greenwich Safeguarding Adults Annual Report. This is to note uh, the Annual Safeguarding Adults uh, Board Report. Um, and I will now like to uh, welcome Michael Preston Shoot, if that's correct, thank you, uh, the Independent Chair of the Safeguarding Adults Board. That's, this is your report, actually, because actually work even though we work as partners, um, you, you know, you have the, your independence of making sure that we report back and take the lessons and the learning. So I'll hand over to you uh, to speak to your report and then we as a cabinet will consider it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for the uh, invitation. I'll be brief. This is a statutory requirement. It's built into the CARE Act 2014 that we produce an annual report and that we share that with uh, the Chief Executive, the local authority, the ICB, uh, the Borough Commander for the Police, and Health Watch, um, and that we present it to Cabinet and uh, relevant governance committees uh, within the local authority. The statutory responsibility of the Board is to seek assurance about the effectiveness of adult safeguarding and to promote the effectiveness of adult safeguarding and hopefully the report does justice to how we have sought to implement that statutory duty over the last year. I want to commend the contributions from uh, our three statutory partners, and, and particularly uh, from Nick, uh, who's here uh, today. I want to commend the enthusiastic participation of our cabinet member, um, which has been a pleasure and a joy. 
um, I have to say. Um, I also want to commend the strategic partnership across the council because that's something that we have developed over the last uh, few years with Florence, with Jamie, um, with, uh, with Debbie um, and, and others. And, and what that produces is a whole system response to safeguarding. Um, adult safeguarding is just one part of the safeguarding jigsaw, um, uh, as indeed we know from a, um, a safeguarding review which we're sharing with, uh, with our children's colleagues, which we'll report in the fullness of time. Um, we are busy, um, uh, not least with safeguarding adult reviews of which we have five in train at the moment. Uh, we are not an outlier in this borough in relation to safeguarding adult reviews. There are London boroughs that are undertaking more and London boroughs that are undertaking less. We have seen an increase in the referrals uh, for safeguarding adult reviews and I think that is because we have been successful in raising awareness about adult safeguarding amongst our communities in Greenwich but also to be fair and frank amongst our elected members. Um, and I was grateful for those elected members who attended a couple of events that Nick and I did jointly um, to uh, um, outline the responsibilities in the CARE Act in relation to adult safeguarding and the important role that elected members play in that, particularly um, our cabinet member. So I'm assured about the strategic uh, engagement and uh, relationships in the local authority. I'm assured about the strategic relationships between the local authority, the ICB and the police. However, I do have a worry list. One of my worry lists is how we are supporting people living in the community with severe and enduring forms of mental ill health. And that has been the focus of several conversations that Nick and I have had with strategic leaders in, in Oxleys. And I want to get beyond that to actually hear the lived experience of practitioners in Oxleys and indeed people living with mental distress. That's top of my worry list. Um, the police have introduced Right Care, Right Person, as I'm sure many of you are aware. We need to monitor the outcome of the implementation by the Metropolitan Police of Right Care, Right Person to make sure that we are not losing the opportunity to check on the welfare and the well-being um, of um, adults at risk uh, of abuse uh, and neglect. We've more to do to engage our community members and we've more to do to sustain some of the very innovative developments that adult social care has led on. Um, and the innovative development I really wish to emphasize is the one on self-neglect and hoarding. If, if there are two themes within our safeguarding adult reviews, both those published and those not published, the first of those themes is mental health, um, often associated with substance misuse. That's an area where we need to continue to seek assurance. But the second theme is self-neglect. Um, and, and there, again, we are not an outlier. Self-neglect is the most frequently reviewed type of abuse or neglect in England far in excess of any other form of abuse uh, or neglect. Nick and Adult Social Care, with the blessing of the Council, have funded a project on self-neglect and hoarding. Nick, I know, is, is endeavouring to secure the future of that project, but we really need to encourage the ICB and Oxleys uh, to step up and contribute uh, meaningfully in relation to resource to enable that project to continue because it, it has already demonstrated its effectiveness as a couple of the case studies in the annual report will demonstrate. I could go on, but your time is precious, so in, I will indeed, stop. And if we, members we, uh, have comments, I'm First of all, thank you very much uh, for, for coming today and, and speaking uh, to your report. And I appreciate your thanks for the strategic working relationship. The report is, is also to continue that and build on that, uh, report back on those case studies, uh, and also for us to continuously learn from it. So I'm grateful that of the relationship we formed with all partners, noting that this report helps to strengthen that relationship. I'll now hand over to the cabinet member to speak to it. Thank you very much. Um, 
And I guess I also wanted to take the opportunity to thank Michael for all of his work. Um, he, you know, having taken on the post and kind of attended recent meetings, seeing the, the diligence and the scrutiny that he applies uh, in his role, um, I know adds real value um, and asking those difficult questions and ensuring that um, we're kind of uh, making sure that we're doing everything that we can. And we recently had uh, Adult Safeguarding Board meeting this this week, actually. Was it this week? Yes, it was. Yes. Um, it's, it's been so cool. No, last week. Sorry, it was last week. Um, and it was really, really thought-provoking discussion, um, digging into the complexities of uh, homelessness and domestic violence and seeing how Michael is using that board to bring directorates together and have the important cross-cutting discussions and uh, and asking those those questions about how we can do better and make sure we're doing the best we can to safeguard and, and protect adults in our borough. So I'm really, really um, heartened by the work and, and the challenge that we have and uh, doing everything we can, I think, to, to improve and protect those um, at risk. So thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, are members happy to agree decisions? To apologise. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, in section 1.1, agreed. Thank you very much. We will now move on to our final item for cabinet today, which is the quarter one budget monitor. To note the council's revenue position at the end of quarter one, I'm not convinced we need an officer presentation, but potentially need a, a, a cabinet member opening. So we'll hand over to Councillor Highland. Okay, I'll, I'll be very quick. Um, I'd like to thank the finance team, firstly. This report is for the end of quarter one. Um, that's April to the end of June. Um, we know, don't we, we've seen on BBC in the last 24 hours how expensive some of these individual placements are and how they're putting councils at risk all over the country and we are no exception. Um, thank goodness we've got very good senior management um, looking after the, that situation, but nevertheless, it could put us um, in the red by 5.1 million uh, at the end of this financial year. In total, 8 million point six, so eight and a half, just over eight and a half million, um, is the situation as it is now. And that includes all of the cuts we've made. And if we don't make all of those, some of those are fairly risky or delayed, then we could see that rise to 15.6 million. So it's so important that all the directors and cabinet members are bringing home those savings. And I'll uh, open for any questions, Chair, thank you. Um, I don't see any hands for questions or indications. I guess I would like to thank officers as well um, for their work on this, because I know out of the um, plus 100 proposals, actually largely we are cracking on with making those savings, and that's fundamentally uh, required to safeguard the future of this authority. If we're gonna keep delivering the services we need for our residents, we need to make sure we balance our books uh, so I'm grateful for all the work. I know there's some challenges in the report which is reflected there, but the articulation of what we're trying to do and the difficulty around it is well articulated. So thank you for your work on this, and I would ask that we keep up the work and that we lend our voices and we keenly wait for the 30th of October to further find out the future of local authorities when government begins to set out their position uh, on, on the budget and their spending review. Thank you. Are members happy to agree to the decision as outlined in section 1.1? Thank you very much for attending Cabinet, everyone. Have a good day.